Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie Boozer. I'm with CGC HQ, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's Connect with Citrix and take a deep dive into TLS 1.3. Um, very quickly before we get started, just want to go over a couple of housekeeping details for you. I'd like to remind you to type your questions into the question panel on the GoToWebinar control panel off to your uh, right. And uh, Mike Nelson, who is our moderator today, will keep an eye on those. Mike is a member of the CUGC Content Working Group. He is a CTP, he, and you can see all of his accolades. He's a Microsoft MVP, a VMware vExpert, an Azure advisor, and uh, you can find him on Twitter at, at Nell Media. Um, Mike, would you like to say hello real quick? Sure. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, like Stephanie said, please uh, post your questions and I'll be taking a look at them and, and asking the presenters. They'll be taking breaks along the way and uh, and answering any questions you have. So um, let us know what, what you need what you need to uh, to understand about TLS uh, 1.3. Thank you, Mike. All right. Um, we have a host of presenters with us today, all from the Citrix NetScaler team. So quickly, I'll just introduce them. We have Pankaj Harnamka. He is a product manager and specializes in NetScaler traffic management, TLS, and network security. We also have Tushar Kanakar. He is the director of product development. He's a net, he focuses on NetScaler, TLS, SSL engineering team, um, also security. And Andrew Penner is the principal software engineer and he has a focus on NetScaler security protocols. So with that, I will hand things over to Pankaj to get us started. And Andrew, I'm sending the screen controls your way right now. Awesome. Thanks, Stephanie. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. So today we are going to talk about the deep dive into TLS 1.3. If we talk about the protocol, it needs no introduction. Andrew, can you please go ahead? Yeah. So the agenda for today's session, for next one hour, we'll be talking about a lot about TLS 1.3, in fact. We'll start with the introduction about the protocol and why there is so much interest in TLS 1.3, the what and why of TLS 1.3, a deep dive into the handshake protocol features and the record protocol features, and you'll hear a lot of heavyweight information from Andrew directly. So with that, let me directly get into the introduction, and uh, which basically, I don't need to introduce like TLS and SSL needs no introduction. They are primarily used to secure communication between clients and servers by encrypting the application traffic. The first popular version of SSL that is SSL 2.0 came in 1995. And since then, a lot has changed in the latest version. Not only the protocol version is changing, the way clients connect to the servers is changing. As per Mozilla, the percentage of websites loaded by Firefox using HTTPS is growing at a very fast pace. And your next slide, please. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. So as you see in this graph, the rate at which the servers supporting SSL or HTTPS is growing at a very fast rate. Only in one year from Jan 2017 to Jan 2018, overall HTTPS traffic has grown from 50% to 70%. And that's a significant growth in a very small period. Not only more servers are running TLS now, but also they're running stronger ciphers and protocols. Next slide. So Poodle, Beast, RoboAttacks, as well as the RC4 and other SSL vulnerabilities have led to the stronger TLS implementation across the globe. As you see on the graphs, more than 90% of the servers today support TLS 1.2, and in 2018, 
and almost 100% servers use 2K or stronger keys. Citrix Netscaler is playing a big part in this journey. Netscaler enables its customers to use the latest and most secure ciphers and protocols while connecting clients and servers. In this hybrid multi-cloud world, when your apps are deployed on on-prem as well as cloud, the connection both client side and server side are equally important and vulnerable to attacks. In those cases, Citrix Netscaler is providing the same level of security across the front end and the back end side of the connections. If you go to the next slide, we'll see that on the similar lines, Netscaler became the first ADC to announce TLS 1.3 support in Q4 last year. We did a beta release of TLS 1.3 draft 21 and saw very good response from partners and customers. On the next slide, you'll see my friend Jason, who is a great Netscaler advocate and a Citrix technology partner, was one of the first to try our beta build and shared his excitement through this tweet. So he said that first ADC in the world to support TLS 1.3 is Netscaler, and he asks everyone to try it out by yourself. So if you have not tried TLS 1.3 yet, and want to see the handshake happening in your own network, register for the beta access. We will share the beta link in the chat for easy access. And at this time, I would like to do a poll question and get your answers on that. Awesome. So we'll close the poll in five seconds. Any last answer? Thank you. That's a very good response. So from here, I would like to pass, uh, I would like to invite Tushar Kanekar to speak some words about the TLS 1.3 implementation in Netscaler. Thanks, Pankaj. Hello, everyone. Um, just wanted to give some background from the engineering side. So as Pankaj highlighted, Netscaler was the first ADC to announce support for TLS 1.3. Um, that was beta on draft 21 in uh, November 2017. So we have been working on TLS 1.3 protocol implementation for more than a year back, uh, maybe starting from RFC version 18 and trying to catch up with the different RFC. Uh, revisions happening along the way. Um, so we are currently working uh, to catch up to the latest one. Um, and what what good timing. Uh, we just got the news that RFC is being ratified yesterday. I think that's a draft 28. So a bit background. So compared to other protocol implementation that we worked on, whether it's SSL v3, TLS 1, 1.2, where we had taken some code from the open source, uh, mainly OpenSSL, as the TLS 1.3 is designed and developed from ground up because we had started way before any other uh, open source like OpenSSL announcing uh, their code bits to the world. So TLS 1.3 is designed uh, with a lot of focus on performance, uh, mainly one RTT, zero RTT, and also security. Uh, how to provide protection from early data attack scenarios. So those were the two main focus from the design side, from engineering side in implementing TLS 1.3 in Netscaler. So with that short um, tidbits, I'll hand over to Andrew to do a deep dive in TLS 1.3 protocol and how Netscaler has implemented the RFC requirements. Over to Andrew. All right. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Tushar. Uh, good morning. My name is Andrew Penner, and I've been working on implementing the TLS 1.3 protocol in Netscaler. Uh, today, I'm just going to give a tour of the, the protocol and show you what new benefits it brings for Netscaler application delivery. Uh, just to recap real quick, uh, TLS stands for Transport Layer Security, and it's actually a suite of protocols 
um, the two main parts that we'll be focusing on here are the handshake protocol and the record protocol. The handshake serves essentially the same purpose um, in TLS 1.3 as it did before. So first of all, it enables the client and server to agree on which cryptographic parameters they, they want to use for the connection. It's also the method by which the client and server arrive at a shared secret key that's used for excuse me, encrypting application data. And finally, the handshake allows each party to also verify that the other side uh, is who they say they are. Um, TLS is intended to provide a secure stream abstraction for applications, and it sits in between TCP and the application layer. Um, it can be sort of inserted seamlessly there. And this design and, and functionality is provided by the record protocol. So the, the record protocol kicks in after the handshake um, is complete to uh, protect the application data. So this is um, hopefully all well and good and hopefully looks familiar to everyone. But so the question is if you can accomplish all of this securely with a good TLS 1.2 config, um, why exactly was TLS 1.3 created? Well, so the first thing to observe is that TLS 1.2 um, it's gained a lot of features over the years and the resulting complexity has led to some pretty serious issues. Uh, some were issues in the protocol itself. Um, others, uh, like Heartbleed, for example, were implementation bugs that just popped up because there were all these obscure features that um, most endpoints didn't need. So better security and, more importantly, fewer insecure options is a, a really huge motivator for an update. And that's I saw in the poll results that that's, um, looks like what um, most people are interested in as well about TLS 1.3. So another observation here is that the handshake adds latency to the application. This is maybe obvious to state, but <laughs> there's an opportunity now to improve on the old handshake design to reduce latency. So the old TLS handshake, um, it was designed long ago. I mean, um, in the, the 90s, essentially, and, and the, when at this time, public key cryptography that's that's used in the handshake was extremely expensive um, for the, the hardware of the time. And so my impression um, as a newcomer to this world is that sort of on balance, the old handshake design was aimed at um, reducing computational requirements rather than minimizing latency. Uh, but TLS 1.3 will change that. So speed is another big motivator for an update. Um, so yeah, as we said, the, the first design goal for TLS 1.3 is to improve security. And the first strategy can essentially be thought of as cleaning up the protocol to get rid of everything that's known to be insecure. Um, you would do this by configuration in your TLS 1.2 servers, but the, the, the fact remains that the protocols um, 1.2 and earlier allow all of these insecure options to be used. So one big example is that the static key exchange algorithms are, are no longer allowed in TLS 1.3. We'll come back to that and look at, in more detail later. Another strategy here for the, the TLS 1.3 designers is to simplify the protocol and make it more straightforward to implement and more amenable to formal verification techniques. Um, if the state machine is too complex, it um, it's... Uh, becomes nearly impossible to provide any sort of formal verification that there aren't uh, unintended state transitions possible or something like that. So there's also a number of features we'll look at that improve privacy. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get to some of those in a, in a bit. So just a, a side comment, Netscaler does um, have existing features that let you accomplish some of this stuff in 1.2 deployment uh, by config, as I was saying. So, for example, you can use um, built-in cipher groups to make sure that you're always protected with forward, forward secrecy. You can use um, stronger AEAD algorithms um, by binding the right uh, ciphers and things. So the point with TLS 1.3 is that it aims to make the secure choices the only choice available. Um, yeah, so the next... Uh, 
main design goal was um, to reduce handshake latency. And so TLS 1.3 has a, an entirely new handshake state machine that takes one round trip instead of two for most cases. And that's a pretty significant win. There's a, a completely new feature in addition that allows the client to send encrypted application data immediately in its first um, flight of TLS messages. Um, and since it doesn't have to wait for any round trips before it's sending application data, this handshake type is referred to as a zero round trip handshake. So this is a, a neat feature that we'll look at as well. So let's take a, a closer look here at the handshake protocol. This slide shows an abstracted outline of the handshake protocol. It's basically the same set of goals um, that I, I touched on earlier and it, it, that's accomplished in all versions of the TLS handshake. But um, it sort of helped me to have this functional view in mind to understand the, the new protocol details better. Uh, so first, the client offers up its capabilities in its initial message, and the server then chooses which parameters it wants to use for the connection. Um, the key exchange is where the client and the server derive a shared secret using some form of public key cryptography. And then the authentication phase is where the client and server have a chance to validate that the, the other side is who they say they are by exchanging certificates signed by some um, some trusted certificate authority. Uh, TLS 1.3, just like all TLS versions before, involves the client speaking first. Uh, but there's this issue where the client doesn't know what versions the server supports at the outset. So as a, a quick example of how version negotiation used to work in TLS 1.2, let's say that the client's first message indicates that the client supports 1.2. Um, and let's say the server supports 1.2 as well. So the server just replies uh, indicating that 1.2 should be used. This all sounds easy enough and it's clear how this version negotiation mechanism was supposed to work. Uh, you would, you know, in TLS 1.3, you would just indicate in the client's first message that the client is willing to support TLS 1.3. But it turns out that this version field in the client hello can't actually be changed in practice because there's these buggy TLS implementations in the wild that essentially break the connection as soon as they see some value they don't understand. So the first detail here about TLS 1.3 is that they had to come up with a completely new version negotiation mechanism because this old one does not work. Um, these middle boxes like uh, gateways or, or um, other, you know, kind of ADCs that are not net scalar, fortunately, <laughs> um, that have these bugs is, is a clear violation of the spec, but as a practical matter, you can't deploy TLS 1.3 this way. If 5% of the time you try to, to make a handshake, you just get a TCP reset. Um, so th the way this new version um, negotiation mechanism works is uh, through a new extension called supported versions. And the version field in the client hello is now just a dummy value that is set to um, a, a value for backwards compatibility. The, the TLS 1.3 server only looks at this new extension to determine what uh, versions the client really supports. Um, I wanted to call out this new mechanism. Just it's important to keep in mind if you're looking at packet traces or something like that, because the version number that you see in the client hello message uh, could now sort of be lying to you and you've got to check for this supported versions extension in the, the client hello in the server hello to understand what's really going on. Uh, there's another new mechanism in the TLS 1.3 handshake which is related to version negotiation and it gives protection against or better protection against uh, protocol downgrade attacks. Protocol downgrade attack goes basically where is, is where the client offers up a particular version. The attacker modifies that request um, in transit so that it appears that the client supports some lower version. Uh, the server supports 1.3, but it elects to use 1.2 because this would satisfy the modified client hello. 
Um, the result here is that the attacker has now caused the two endpoints that both speak 1.3 to proceed using a, a lower version. So this is generally something where you want to prevent any further interaction if this situation is detected. Um, TLS 1.3, uh, whenever the, the server selects a version lower than 1.3, it now writes a special value in the server hello, um, a sentinel value. And a real TLS 1.3 client can check for this sentinel value if the server ever chose something less than 1.3 the client would just abort the handshake if that magic value is detected because it knows somebody in the middle has um, caused a, a false downgrade. If the client genuinely doesn't support 1.3, then this sentinel value won't really interfere with anything. Um, and this allows the, the natural downgrade to work in case the client or the server doesn't actually support 1.3, but it makes sure that the handshake fails immediately. Um, after the first messages in case the, the downgrade is forced by um, some network attacker. So now we have, uh, let's see, securely figured out which version we're gonna use for the handshake and we need to start figuring out the cryptographic parameters. Um, that starts with the Cypher Suite. So Cypher Suite is not a new concept in, in Abstractly, it's just a, a collection of parameters that has a unique ID. Um, clients and servers will negotiate a single Cypher suite and then they'll use that uh, indicated the parameters there for the rest of the connection. The takeaway at this point is just that TLS 1.3 redefines which parameters are being specified when you give a, a particular Cypher suite. Um, TLS 1.2 used to define these four uh, separate parameters or algorithms um, with each Cypher suite ID. And because of this design, there were lots and lots of Cypher suites available. We basically needed one to represent any relevant combination of these four separate um, algorithms. Now in TLS 1.3, the, the Cypher suite only represents two particular algorithms and everything else is negotiated separately. So as a result of this, there are actually very few Cypher suites defined for 1.3. Um, here's a, a table showing what those five are. Uh, you can't use any previous Cypher suite in, in 1.3 because of how the term itself has been redefined. And you can't use any of these new Cypher suites in an old protocol either. These are just 1.3 only exists sort of in its own world. Uh, that means if you want to use TLS 1.3 in Netscaler, just make sure um, that one of these TLS 1.3 ciphers is also bound to the vServer or the profile. They'll be there by default, but it's just something to keep in mind. Um, another thing that you can see is just that if you're looking at a long list of cipher suite IDs, you can pick out the TLS 1.3 ones because they're, oh, excuse me, their first byte of the identifier starts with the, the hex digit one three. Um, so the Cypher suite has told us now which symmetric encryption algorithm we'll use later on and which hash function is gonna be used for um, key derivation. The next main thing that the client and server have to figure out is what key exchange algorithm to use. Um, first, let's just see what are the options available in the first place. Um, for a client that's never talked to a server before, there's actually only one option in TLS 1.3 that is that is using the ephemeral Diffie-Hellman key exchange algorithm to derive a shared secret. This comes in two flavors and it depends on which math is used under the hood, but in Netscaler, um, in the 1.3 server, we're supporting only the more modern elliptic curve variant. Uh, just a quick recap or a review of how the Diffie-Hellman algorithm works. Um, it, each side starts by picking two values. One value they keep secret and the other one they send to the peer. And after each side has exchanged their public values, they combine the peer's public value with their own private value. And in the end, this combined va value is actually the same on both sides. And crucially, the combined value is also secret because anyone observing the 
the public value exchange they can't compute the shared secret because they don't have the each side's secret values so it's uh, i mean decades old it's really clever and a simple way to establish a shared secret before any secure channel has been set up um, it's not new, but the fact that it's the only option for every initial handshake is new here in TLS 1.3. Um, now, if the client has completed a handshake with the server before, it may be able to reuse the shared secret from a previous connection. This is the resumption handshake, and it, it comes, um, it's basically the same concept that existed in TLS 1.2, but the mechanisms are different, and we'll see more about that. The secret derived from the initial connection is called the pre-shared key. So during subsequent connections, the client can offer a PSK to the server, and then the server decides to accept it or reject it and fall back to a full handshake. There's new extensions defined that the client sends to indicate which of these three modes that it wants to use, either the um, initial handshake or a resumed handshake with the PSK only or a resumed handshake with the PSK plus an ECDHE exchange. Um, let's see, so the big picture here is a, actually a pretty big departure from TLS 1.2 because static key exchange algorithms like RSA are um, nowhere mentioned. <laughs> Static keys um, basically have one major disadvantage, which is that they lack forward secrecy. Basically, this just means that if the server's private key is um, is compromised somehow, then all traffic previously exchanged with that server under that key can now be decrypted. But the ephemeral Diffie-Hellman algorithm ensures that there's a unique key for every handshake, and it makes this kind of um, uh, attack impossible. So let's see, at this point, the client and the server have a shared secret established with the, the ECDHE exchange, and they've chosen a cipher suite. Um, we've got enough of the basics uh, covered here. Let's take a look at a handshake dialog. So I put up a, a TLS 1.2 handshake skeleton here just as a review. Um, these aren't the literal names of the messages and things. Uh, but hopefully this is just as a conceptual overview. The first thing the client does is offer its capabilities in a client hello. The server chooses which cipher suite to use, and then that in turn defines the key exchange algorithm. The server's reply also includes this public key share value appropriate for the key exchange algorithm that it chose. And then it sends its uh, certificate and a signature that proves that it has the certificate's private key. The Client follows up by sending its key share to the server. And at this point, both sides can now compute the shared secret. Uh, this happens to be the point where encryption kicks in and messages sent after this are encrypted using uh, encryption keys derived from those shared secrets. The encrypted data here is marked with uh, square brackets in the diagram, by the way. So as soon as you see both sides have sent their key share, that's uh, when encryption can start. Um, and now, basically, the, the handshake is done after the, the finished max are exchanged. And assuming that we're using some application protocol like HTTP, uh, where the client speaks first, the third round trip at the TLS layer is now where application data can finally be exchanged. So let's look then at TLS 1.3 and how we shave off an entire round trip here. Um, Essentially, the key exchange just takes place during the first round trip instead of um, during the second. This is a reasonable attempt now for this uh, new design because the client knows that Diffie-Hellman is actually the only possible key exchange algorithm. All it has to do is predict which curve the server is likely to support. Um, the client sends key shares for one or more curves, and if any of those key shares that it offers is selected by the server, then the shared key is established and uh, during the first round trip, essentially. Um, now that each side has a shared secret, uh, and the, after the, the key shares are exchanged, um, we can 
start using that to encrypt messages right away. So as a side effect of how this has been restructured, you also can encrypt most of the handshake, including the server certificate, which is now um, hidden from view. Also, other parameters that are sent in the encrypted extensions message, like um, which optional features are being used, OCSP stapling or you know, other things like that. Um, the takeaway here is that uh, TLS 1.3 completes this initial handshake in one round trip instead of two. And also, just to, to reiterate, that encryption kicks in right away to keep more of the handshake private. The new scheme does allow the possibility that the client mispredicts which curve uh, the server will select when it sends its first key share. Um, this would result in a, a situation where you can't do a key exchange because the client has chosen one curve and the server wants to use a different curve. Uh, this is handled, but it costs an extra round trip. So let's look at this. <coughs> um, in the retry scenario, the client selected a curve and sent the key share, um, but the server happened to prefer something different. And so it replies with this new um, hello retry request message to inform the client which curve it should use instead. Uh, the client sends a, an updated client hello, and then from this point on, uh, the handshake is exactly as before. You just have this uh, additional round trip inserted at the beginning. This uh, allows the handshake to ultimately complete, but the retry costs a round trip, and so we want to see how we can avoid that if possible. Um, so let's see. There's there's uh, two ideas for how how to um, how to prevent this. Basically, standardize hopefully across the ecosystem on a, on a very small set of good curves. Um, Netscaler will support the P two fifty six curve by default um, as the most preferred choice. And most clients also prefer this curve or the X25519 curve. So just by the fact that everyone is sort of using the same um, good choice from a small set of options in the first place, uh, we can uh, reduce the number of mispredicted um, key share offerings. There's also something Netscaler can do in making the assumption that it's preferred um, curve bindings aren't changing frequently. I mean, if you would set up your server how you want and then probably leave it that way. So Netscaler will automatically inform clients of its configured curve preferences when it sends out the encrypted extensions message. This is through an extension called supported groups that's uh, noted here. A client that's smart about this situation can remember the information in this supported groups extension and use it in the future. Um, in, in subsequent handshakes to predict uh, correctly which key shares to offer. Um, so let's see, before we go on to talk about authentication, does anyone have any questions here so far? Yes, sir, we do, as a matter of fact. But uh, um, uh, Tishar and uh, uh, Pankaja have actually been answering them as they come along. So, okay, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, if anyone is on the uh, on the call would like to take a look at the questions that were asked and already answered, you can open up the uh, the, the questions tab and you'll be able to see them. Um, so we don't have to to go over them again. But um, one of them that yeah. actually is not answered yet is. Uh, what do you? What are your ideas on? You know, this this is kind of a, a progression that that every protocol, when it comes out, takes, right? So, uh, will it take, uh, uh, you know, three to five years for TLS 1.3 to actually level across the board with websites, browsers, you know, um, ADCs, so so on and so forth, all the devices that are going to be required to to support it. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> From what I've seen, basically at this point, the protocol has been in development for um, many years. And if you look across the ecosystem, there are interoperable implementations already basically everywhere. I mean, OpenSSL um, has beta releases out that support this. Apple's stack has support for this. Um, Microsoft has support for this as well. Um, Everyone has sort of implementations kind of ready to go because of how uh, 
long and winding the the road was to to uh, work through all the issues in the later drafts. So right. there will certainly be kind of a big splash, I think, of uh, of, um, of uh, people using this right off the bat. Uh, some things are already experimental, but like Chrome uses uh, draft twenty three by default. As of a couple of weeks ago, it sends um, client hellos that look like uh, TLS one point three. So it's um, since it's been in development for so long, and everyone has had time to to sort of gear up as it's been going. I think it will. Sure, 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 it's sure. Let me add a few uh, points. So, so the if you look at the history, right, the move from SSL v3 to TLS 1.2, that was mainly driven by serious flaws in SSL v3 protocol, right? Um, TLS 1.2 is still secure, provided you have configured it properly, like you've selected the right ciphers, uh, not using RSA, so you can still use TLS 1.2 by further hardening the configuration. But the move to TLS 1.3, is driven by two things, uh, not just security, better security, but also higher performance with respect mm -hmm. to one RTT and zero RTT. So we are also closely tracking how the ecosystem is moving and what we believe is there'll be very early adopters, uh, maybe mainly Google, Apple, Microsoft. Uh, there are some cloud vendors like Cloudflare uh, actively uh, working on uh, doing the right stuff on the infrastructure side. So. Uh, Certainly, there'll be early adopters, and then um, there'll be people who will wait and then follow up for the ecosystem to be fully compatible end to end with TLS 1.3. But as as the benefits are with both security and performance, I think uh, folks will uh, move quickly. Yeah, yeah, um, and that's that's pretty much true across the board. Like you mentioned, you know, when 1.2 came on the scene, that was kind of the the same thing, um, but as as Andrew says, uh, a lot of a lot of the manufacturers have already been working on you know the compatibility, uh, and they've been using the the drafts of 1.3. And and uh, as was noted, you know 1.3 got ratified actually yesterday. So uh, and I know that uh, one of our questions here is he's asking for the link for the ratification. Um, you should be able to get that from the IETF. I, I actually saw it on Twitter yesterday. One of the members of the IE, IETF uh, tweet, tweeted it out that they ratified it. So um, I'm sure we can find the link out there somewhere um, and I'll see if I can post it in there. Um, another question that we do have is, uh, will TLS 1.3, um, and I'm assuming this is true, um, but I'm gonna ask it anyways. Uh, will 1.3 support be available on every Netscaler platform? You know, the VPX, MPX, SDX, so, and CPX. Um, and front end, back end communications at the same time, uh, or will the support be staged? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that once you make a change to the 12 code, okay, um, that's going to go across all the devices. Am I, am I wrong on that? Uh, let me take that. Um, so, so for TLS 1.3, for us to support across all platform, we also are dependent on the vendors, the crypto vendors. Um, uh, the crypto cards that we use in our MPX STX boxes. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so most of the vendors are also watching the the RFC draft movement, and they're waiting for RFC to get ratified, and then they will have their own development QA cycle to confirm to the latest draft. So we are also following up and also pushing the vendors to be up to speed on how the draft is moving, so that when we announce support for our platform, it's, it's um, more or less uh, across the board. But the way it will happen is um, we have been implementing in software. So the support on VPX will be there. On hardware platform, you have option uh, to do it in software. So it won't be accelerated, but that's how we have designed it. Even the beta, if you deploy it on a hardware MPX or STX box, TLS 1.3 will work, but it will be done in software. Okay. Um, so we are we are working with the crypto vendors to get the required uh, support and then uh, we'll have some development phase to implement the changes that they have done and then release the the highly accelerated um, TLS 1.3 uh, support. Okay, to, to, to add on to that question then, will, um, the next one from Lee is, will there be support for FIPS uh, appliances, uh, the Netscaler appliances? 
and for good question so yeah. so that's another a big wait time because uh, the nist uh, the nist body which certifies any crypto or protocol they haven't taken up tls 1.3 so it's not at fips certified protocol same is true for chacha poly ciphers which is the main cipher along with ahgcm for 1.3 so until and unless uh, this protocol and ciphers are NIST certified, uh, the FIPS crypto card vendors will not add support in their firmware, and then we cannot claim support for those uh, protocol and ciphers in our FIPS appliance. Sure, sure, okay. Um, the last one I'll go, and I'll let Andrew, I'll, I'll let you go after this. Uh, um, one of the questions is, does anyone know if IE will support 1.3? Obviously, IE is not even really supported by Microsoft any longer. So um, if you're talking about Edge, Edge is still in development. Um, I know that uh, just by looking at uh, looking it up is that uh, Edge is still in, they call it in development um, for the full support of the 1.3 uh, uh, version of TLS. So, okay, Andrew, uh, back to you. Okay, great, thanks. <clears throat> so, We'll just touch here briefly on um, authentication. We said at the outset that authentication is another main function of the handshake. Um, <clears throat> and the big privacy improvement that we've kind of already seen is that the server's identity in the in the form of the certificate is now encrypted instead of being sent in the clear. Aside from that, the overall structure of authentication looks more or less the same, but a lot of the details are different. The server still uses a public key encryption to generate a signature over the handshake, uh, but some of the supported algorithms have changed for security reasons. Uh, for example, the DSA signature algorithm can no longer be used to sign the transcript. So any server certificates you happen to have with uh, DSA keys can't be used any longer in TLS 1.3. There's a new requirement also that anytime an RSA key is used to sign the handshake, that the handshake, um, that's the, sorry, the signature that goes in the handshake has to use this more secure padding scheme called PSS. You probably don't have to worry about this um, detail because you can continue using whatever RSA keys um, Netscaler you've already got uh, bound to your vServer and Netscaler will just automatically handle generating the right signature padding during the handshake. The signature algorithms extension that was used back in, in 1.2 is reused in 1.3, but it's um, the semantics are a little bit different. It, now this, is, this extension is the only way to negotiate signature algorithms. Um, whereas in 1.2, there was some interaction between uh, the Cypher suite uh, indicating a signature algorithm um, or this uh, extension just sort of being optional. The last thing to, to note here is just that um, kind of a common question. SNI or the server name extension works the same as it did before. TLS 1.3 um, had some ideas kicking around at some point, but this, this uh, essentially is just still sent in the clear in the client hello, just as it always was. Um, so just to, to touch briefly on what this looks like in the handshake, um, there's uh, also support for client authentication, same as in 1.2. And this is where the server requests that the client provide a certificate during the signature. Um, so so that, you know, within the TLS layer itself, the server can know who it's talking to. This is not exactly common on the web because usually client authentication happens in the application layer, like with a username or password or something. Um, but anyways, if you've got your Netscaler configured to do, to do client auth, you would typically set whether you want mandatory authentication or optional. And in either of these cases, the server is going to now send this certificate request message in its first reply to the client. The client then follows up sending its cert and a signature. The messages used here, the certificate and the certificate verify message, which contains the signature, these have been unified so that the client and the server basically send the exact same format of messages, uh, regardless of which direction it's going. Um, the client's identity here is encrypted. Uh, again, 
you know, it's just the square brackets in the diagram notate the encrypted records. This is a bigger win for uh, client auth, actually, because it used to be that if you needed your certificate, um, your client certificates to sort of remain private, you had to jump through a lot of hoops. Like you, you basically, if you requested client auth uh, from from the initial handshake, you would essentially advertise your uh, list of certificates out in the clear. Um, but to to prevent this, you had to uh, like do an initial handshake and then renegotiate um, where the, the server triggers a, a whole new handshake on the encrypted channel set up by the first handshake. Then you'd request a cert during the second handshake um, where it would be hidden. TLS 1.3 um, gets rid of all of that wasted effort. And now um, the client cert is just protected by default in the initial handshake. Um, let's see, the other thing to, to note here is that client auth doesn't add any round trips to the handshake just as before. Um, okay, so we can talk now about uh, session resumption. The, the concept of resumption um, is exactly the same as it was before, but the details are all new. Uh, so TLS 1.2 had this dedicated mechanism in the protocol for stateful session resumption. This was called session IDs. And in this case, the server would store state from a connection in some internal database and then give the client a, a lookup token that it could give back during a future handshake. The server would retrieve the state from the database and then you can skip part of the handshake using that um, cached state. Uh, there was also a separate dedicated mechanism in the protocol for stateless session resumption where the server would use some um, private encryption key to bundle up the state into an encrypted blob that, that no one but the server can read. And it hands that blob to the client um, and then the client gives that blob back in the future to resume the session. And then lastly, there was this third separate dedicated mechanism in the protocol for um, handshakes based on pre-shared symmetric keys. This is where some uh, symmetric keys are provisioned to the client and the server out of band. And then, um, I don't know, this, this is, is used uh, sometimes for IoT or, or use cases where public key cryptography is um, too expensive. But so the TLS 1.3 designers looked at this situation and, and realized that all of these cases are essentially doing the same thing. They are taking some long-term symmetric key material uh, from the initial handshake, storing it somewhere on the client or the server or both, and then using it later to quickly bootstrap a handshake. So TLS merges, uh, sorry, TLS 1.3 merges all of these into the single mechanism called pre-shared keys. Um, so what does this look like? Uh, the initial handshake is not shown here. This is a picture of a, a resumption handshake. But during the initial handshake, the server sends um, information to the client that's needed to resume in a new session ticket message. In the new unified resumption scheme, the ticket is actually just a string that the client treats as opaque data. It could be a session ID, as in the old session ID mechanism. It could be a ticket, as in the old session tickets mechanism, or it could just be some arbitrary number that you've agreed is going to be your, your key. Um, TLS doesn't actually care anymore. That's the point, is that these different mechanisms in the protocol are now merged into one. So NetScaler's TLS 1.3 implementation offers the stateless form of resumption, which is um, equivalent to what, what we used to have in 1.2 for the feature called session tickets. Um, this is where the, the state is offloaded to the client. So to resume a previous connection, the client just sends the, uh, the ticket from the initial handshake in its pre-shared key extension in the client hello. And if the server can decrypt it, then a bunch of other uh, validation checks also have to pass. And if that happens, the, the handshake proceeds and um, the pre-shared key is used as the basis for encryption. Uh, no other key exchange or, or authentication needs to take place. Um, 
Let's see, TLS 1.3 also has another useful option here, which is a variant of this, where you can mix in a fresh ephemeral secret into the key material so that the resumed session's keys can't be derived from the initial session's keys as it, it can be in this case. So this looks a little bit different. And now, instead of sending just the pre-shared key extension, the client uh, sends a key share along with its uh, pre-shared key. And this is the same key share that's used for initial handshakes. Um, and the, the client, uh, when it sends both of these, it's indicating that it wants to uh, perform a fresh ECDHE key exchange along with the PSK. The additional key exchange here gives forward secrecy to this resumed connection because now you've got a fresh secret mixed into the key material and that makes it impossible to decrypt traffic on this new connection, even if you know the keys for the old connection. Um, so this is a, a really nice feature because now, um, as we saw earlier, initial handshakes always have forward secrecy in TLS 1.3. And there's this way to achieve forward secrecy as well in the resumption handshake. So this is good for security. Um, there's one more uh, type of handshake that we need to look at, which is the zero round trip handshake. Um, <clears throat> this is basically a resumption handshake, but the client can elect to also send application data encrypted with keys um, derived from the previous handshake. So the records containing the application request are, are called early data records, and they do have different security properties than data sent after the handshake completes. Um, the diagram here is showing an encrypted get and an encrypted application response, um, and they're sort of taking place overlaid on top of the first round trip in the TLS layer. This is a huge speed improvement, obviously, with this feature because you don't have to wait the first round trip before you can send your uh, GET request. There's an additional wrinkle here with early data security properties. So I'll come back to that in a second, but just real quick, I wanna show something neat you can do when you combine this with TCP fast open. Um, so I think, TCP fast open and the zero RTT handshake are kind of made to be used together and you get the, the lowest possible latency um, for, for 1.3 handshakes when you use these. Um, I haven't shown this in all of the handshake diagrams, but there's uh, this implicit round trip taken by TCP before any of these handshakes takes place, right? Because the, the TCP SYN and ACK has to go, um, has to be exchanged before the, the channel is open for TLS to start using. But TCP fast open is a mechanism that basically it's the same concept as session tickets, but for TCP state. And so once the client and server have communicated with each other in the past, then the client can just um, use its cached uh, TCP and TLS state to basically send a, a a single outgoing packet that contains the SYN bit, the, the TCP fast open cookie, the client hello message, the resumption ticket, and also an encrypted GET request, all in the same outbound packet. So using these features together lets you actually realize this um, zero round trip concept, even when you factor in TCP. Yeah, so, so, uh, so Andrew, if you go back to a previous slide, I just want to highlight, um, yeah. So in the bottom left box, what the two commands that uh, Andrew is kind of uh, portraying, right, in all the slides, those are the Netscaler config. So we, just to highlight that this mechanism is supported today via this two config change. So just to highlight that to all the audience. Okay, so um, zero RTT with TCP fast open is like zero RTT on steroids. Okay, yeah, go ahead, yeah, Andrew. <laughs> okay, so the caveat I was referring to earlier about early data, um, don't worry, uh, Netscaler has solutions for this, um, but just to, to discuss the, the issue here, um, it's replay attacks. 
And uh, a simple replay attack on early data goes like this. The client sends a pre-shared key with some application request in an early data record. The network attacker passively makes a copy of the records and sends the copy to the server on a different connection. Um, the HTTP request uh, <laughs> happens to be some instruction to carry out like a credit card transaction. And um, the application server happily processes this request anytime the TLS layer delivers it. And the attacker sends uh, millions more copies. And you can clearly see that this is a big problem. It, it illustrates actually how early data is completely different than all other data exchanged over TLS in, um, in any previous version. Until this feature existed, the, the protocol itself made replay attacks impossible, um, but it's no longer the case with early data. So the protocol gives some guidelines and recommendations about how to use this safely, but the, the spec itself kind of leaves it up to implementations to follow the rules and make this uh, work in a safe manner. So one example is that the spec requires that the client applications have to knowingly opt in before sending a request in early data. It's, excuse me, it's not something that the TLS stack in the client can just um, do on its own. So further, it requires that each and every application protocol out there that is going to be used with TLS 1.3 define some profile for how that app protocol will interact with early data. There's a, um, a spec going through the, the working group that advances HTTP where they've laid out some obvious things like don't send requests with side effects in early data. So per that recommendation, it's, it's clear that the post request in the example here would be extremely ill-advised for a client to attempt. Um, the point being that there's nothing in the protocol that prevents a um, a bad client from doing that. So the spec does also recommend that uh, servers implement some minimal form of anti-replay defense. Um, but I think these these sort of dire sounding precautions in the spec that, that clients should adhere to are also important because if you, if you put yourself in the client's shoes, you actually have no way of knowing from the protocol exactly what kind of anti-replay defense, the, if any, the server has implemented. Um, on the other hand, this feature is so compelling that it still makes sense to use it for requests that the client knows are replay safe. So with the NetScaler TLS server, we're, we're obviously aiming to provide a range of protection options uh, for backend application servers with different needs. This would go all the way up to comprehensive anti-replay protection. Um, is kind of exactly what it sounds like. No, no copy can get through no matter when or where it has arrived. <clears throat> um, the last thing, just to comment on this, is, is uh, also documented in the beta release notes, but these additional replay protection mechanisms are not in place in the beta release that's, that was put out um, last year. So do stay tuned for uh, more updates on this. Um, before we... Uh, move quickly to the very short next section um, about the record protocol. Um, does anyone have any other questions about resumption or early data? I realize we're at the top of the hour, so I have uh, two more slides left if... Um... Yeah, I think we can launch the poll question now. I think this is the right time. Right, Mark? So I'm just launching a question. Please do answer that. It will be helpful for us. Yep, I don't have any other questions in the in the box, Andrew. So, uh, yep, we've got that poll, and then we'll go ahead and with your last couple of slides. Okay, great. Okay, that's nice. Last five seconds. Thank you. Okay, votes are still coming in, so I'll wait for a little bit more. All right, thank you. Over to you, Andrew. Okay, so um, just briefly, uh, 
we'll touch on, on the new features in the record protocol. If you abstract away all the cryptography, uh, the record protocol is, is uh, vastly simpler than the complexity we saw in the handshake protocol. So the record protocol um, multiplexes data from the different sub protocols into a single stream that sits right on top of TCP. Um, this, you know, each record uh, contains a, a content type that identifies which protocol it belongs to. It could be either uh, handshake messages or alert messages or application data. Um, the record layer is what implements the uh, uh, symmetric encryption to provide all of these um, security benefits for the application data. This is all exactly the same in 1.3, uh, but there's some additional features here. So the first thing is the capability in the protocol for, um, for privacy enhancements and a better defense against traffic analysis. There's a new native padding mechanism that allows endpoints to obfuscate the length of their um, of the, the record's actual payload. So the record's content type is also now encrypted and you can't tell from the record header of whether this is a handshake message or application data or what. Um, also related to the record protocol, there's an entirely new HMAC-based key derivation function. And this is designed from the um, perspective of giving better separation between keys used for different purposes. If you, you know, for example, there's, uh, I don't know, eight or 10 different keys derived for different purposes. If you know one of these keys, um, you still can't do any of the other things in the, the protocol that, that require the other keys, like reading and writing data use separate keys, for example. Um, and then the last main change is just that the AEAD cipher construction is now the only allowed choice. This is a, a big security improvement over what was allowed in TLS 1.2. Um, and just to show what this looks like, just to talk about the, the new features here. Um, in the new format, the padding consists of this sequence of zeros and the length of the padding is implicit. So however many zeros are present at the end of the record, that's, that's how much padding there is. Um, this construction works because the type field that you see um, at the end of a TLS 1.3 record just prior to the padding, that type is always a non-zero value. So it's, um, this works uh, without having to store the length of the padding. Um, that's a, a big advantage because if you don't use any padding, then it occupies zero bytes in the record. Um, also, an advantage here is that padding is built into the record protocol, and so it doesn't need to be negotiated separately. Any TLS 1.3 uh, implementation that receives records knows how to depad uh, records. So Netscaler supports this, obviously, as a, a compliant server but we don't yet have features to generate padded records um, to, to obfuscate um, outbound traffic. Um, also, just the last thing is that the, the real record type is now hidden. So after the initial client hello, server hello, uh, record protection kicks in and for the entire remainder of the stream, all you see is a sequence of um, encrypted application data records. What's actually inside may be um, obviously, the, the first few are probably the handshake messages that are being exchanged, but you don't know the real type of those um, uh, content within the encrypted record until you've decrypted it. So this also just gives more um, privacy against traffic analysis type of schemes. Um, and the last thing I have here, uh, I won't really go through this much, but I just wanted to include as a reference um, a summary of sort of the most used options if you want to play around with TLS 1.3 in the Netscaler beta release. Um, these are just some of the commands that you can use. It, it is enabled, the, the protocol is enabled by default in the, um, in the beta, but the resumption features and the early data features are disabled by default. So just stuff to keep in mind if you're playing around. 
And yeah, that's um, all that I've prepared. Uh, I know, sorry, we ran a few minutes over, but if anyone has any other questions, we can um, look at that or else follow up offline on the, on the forums. Yeah, um, thanks for the time today. Yep, uh, we actually uh, uh, don't have any more questions. Uh, so Stephanie, I'll let you close it out here. Um, it would be great to uh, put the last poll question. I think it should be quick, if you don't mind, Mark. Here it is. So please answer this question. I think uh, we'll get good feedback on this and we can share the link. And, uh, and I, I think a lot of you might have already tried it because the uh, beta build has been out for some time. So thanks for your answers. Over to you, Stephanie. Okay, thank you. I just have one last slide I'm going to put up uh, very quickly. There you go. <laughs> um, so thank you. Thanks to everyone. Um, really great presentation today and thanks for all the great questions. Um, if you did not get your question answered, we will take those offline and I will post them in the forum you'll get a link uh, to that forum thread tomorrow in an email from GoToWebinar. That email will also have a link to the recording from today in case you need that. And I know um, we've had a request to share the slide deck. So uh, Andrew, Pankaj, Tashar, are we able to share that on CGC as well? Yes, certainly. Sure, we can do that. Okay, great. So you'll all of that stuff will come to you, all those resources tomorrow in the email from GoToWebinar. Um, also want to just remind you all to fill out our survey. It's very short. I put a link to it in the chat. We love to get your feedback. It helps us plan future webinars and content uh, on the site overall. And um, finally, just make sure you follow us on Twitter at MyCUGC. That's where we put out lots of announcements, updates, local groups information, webinar, blogs, all that great stuff. And um, I think I can let you all go. Um, there, oh, the link that Pankaj mentioned is in the chat window um, if you dig through that, but we'll also make sure there's a link, that link is included on the forum thread as well. So we'll have all of that for you tomorrow. All right, thanks again, guys. It was a great, great presentation. Thanks, Mike, for keeping track of all those questions. And um, we will see you all again sometime soon on my CUGC. Thanks. Thank you.